This is it. This is it. This is <laughs> We're live. This is a big one. I think people are very excited about this one. And you yeah. know, you alluded to something the other day. I thought this one's going to be a breeze. We're just going to talk about how cool Tarantino is and how fun it is. And then the other day we did a gig. You did great. I have. I feel like I have to tell people that you're a good comedian. Because <laughs> Why? Because they hate me. They, they just. A they, <laughs> yeah. They just hate you. And then I think I made a mistake. I was trying to talk about how great you are and defend you on my podcast, and I said he's smarter than all you guys. And I think that made them resent even yeah, more. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're all like fucking Trumpy. Fuck you. I'm like the elite now, right? You sick. You sick your people on me. <laughs> I, they're not. I'm, I'm not responsible for the Trump people. Anyone that is, any one of our fans, my fans, that's a Trump person, is a good Trump person because I, I've made it clear that I think he stinks, and they're still around. So right. No, no, I, I agree, and I, I love, I, I love that we're doing this podcast. I love that people are listening. It does suck that like because I, so few people knew me as a stand up more people now know me as someone who just hates John Candy. Like that's more. That has gone wider than my stand-up. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you're a believer that anyone that voted for Trump is a piece of shit. That's what you were saying the other day. You said no, they're no, a I Nazi. Don't. No, I no, thought you said they're well, a Nazi well, and they fucking, hate women. Quit, all right, quit trying to, you're trying to get your, your people on me. I will not be a heel. I, I do think anyone who supports Trump is either a piece of shit, um, very gullible, or crazy. I think we can all agree on that. And gullible uh, is like dumb. I just mean dumb. You're either a piece of shit, dumb, or crazy, <laughs> or or some combination of the three. I think that's fair, right? I'm not. I'm not gonna go that far. All I mean, right. I know I know some people that are good. I think maybe they 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 bit a, a poison apple, perhaps. But this, by the way, this is the worst way to start anything. <laughs> We've lost everybody. I mean, all the people are gone now. <laughs> well, that's a problem. You have all Trump, but yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we had a great show the other night, and this is a, this is the first time I'm doing it back in my apartment. Yeah, you're back in, in in New York. It's good to have you back, buddy. It's good. It's good to be here, man. I do think uh, it is like when I was at my parents' place. It looked kind of nice, and your place still looks nice. But now it, it feels like my place just looks so much sadder. My actual place <laughs> looks so much sadder than yours right it, now. I just have like looked, a bare white wall. Yeah, it looks like a like a low security prison. Like you did like a <laughs> some kind of like white collar crime. It's just or like a dead plant right there. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so um, and by the way, I have to say it's hilarious that you think this looks nice. Like you are aware <laughs> that I have a nice apartment, but this particular view is just like an IKEA cabinet. My bar is like just like a, the fact that your wall is painted. Like I'm right. like that's fancy. <laughs> you got like a green painted wall. It's pretty good. There's some art and shit over there. Yeah, I got I got nothing here. I got like it's just like bear you know it's just impressive yeah but you know yeah. whatever it feels like um, day one at a, at a dorm or whatever yeah it pretty much is um but yeah so we had to we're doing tarantino this week which is exciting i, I want to be specific 90s tarantino because every time we do which is only three films but every time we do a category People are like, you forgot the Dirty Dozen, you piece of shit. I'm like, we're doing three <laughs> movies. I mean, we can't just do all you the You did the movies. war movies. You didn't do John Wayne's Torah, Torah, Torah from 1940. It's like, you can't do all of them. We'll be yeah, here forever. Just, we're doing a couple. And one guy was like, Apocalypse Now. He sounds like you. He's like, Apocalypse Now is not a war movie. It's about an insane guy. And you're like, okay, but you know what we meant, right? We didn't. It's not like we did fucking Gleaming the Cube as a war movie. <laughs> it's not like Dumb and Dumber's in there. It was a <laughs> Vietnam movie. Yeah, obviously, you know, Apocalypse Now. If you said that's a war movie, no one besides you would be like, what? Like, what are you, crazy? <laughs> um, right. If the director said, I'm making a war movie, <laughs> and this right, is a war movie, right. then it is officially a war movie. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, we're doing early Tarantino, just just the first three. Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown. Just yes. the first three. And Which, uh, mm -hmm. I love them. I love all three. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tip my hand right now and say I love all of them. I know you're gonna hate Reservoir Dogs. You're gonna think Pulp Fiction's about, you know, communists or whatever. Well, okay. Well, let me also explain. Like it's not like sometimes I feel like people think I've never seen these movies. And I'm like watching them for the, like I've just been in a bunker for 25 years. I've seen these movies and love them over time, but I'm re-watching them. So a lot of it is me re-watching from the perspective of now. I mean, I obviously loved all these movies as a kid growing up, you know what I mean? But uh, I re-watch them, which is interesting to watch from this perspective. Like, what do we start with, Reservoir Dogs? Yeah, let's go, we'll go in order. Or, or, yeah, Reservoir Dogs uh, is, um, 
is I think uh, it's <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. It's, it's fun and there's a couple of hilarious moments, but it, you know, it's definitely just, you know what, you know what kind of bugged me this time a little, all the suits they're all wearing. It feels like it's like men in black. It just kind of watching it again. It's, it's just silly that they're all wearing suits, like the same suit. Watching right. it again, definitely feel, and I still think it's very entertaining and there's parts of it I love, but watching it again, definitely, it feels like actors in a movie. Do you get that kind of? Yes. Well, I, I want to say it is actors in a movie. I think that's important. <laughs> <I feel. laughs> It's important to make it clear. I just couldn't help but think I was watching a movie in my apartment. And uh... <laughs> now, so first of all, how are you finding these movies? Because I, I'm buying all these movies on iTunes and I can't find them anywhere. And I, I know you make about six grand a year. So how are you acquiring these films? Uh, HBO Max has the first two. That's two. Right? Yeah, that's true. I had to yeah. buy Jackie Brown, which I own on DVD. I literally have been living the Gary Gullman bit. Where oh, you right. buy a movie on iTunes that is sitting next to you, and you I have, have like, a DVD player. No, I, I do. I have a PS4. Not only do I have a, a, a DVD player, I have like a four hundred dollar DVD player. I've oh. never played PS4 once. It's just a DVD player. Why couldn't you watch it then? Why I didn't feel it? like taking out the Apple cord and then putting in a DVD cord and then taking the DVD and then it loads. Oh, oh that Gary Goldman bit where he's just too lazy. Yeah, yeah, the bit. Oh, yeah, it's insane. Wait, does he have two bits about getting well, iTunes no, I, instead of DVD? I guess I didn't. I guess I didn't fully remember the bit. Uh, but oh, so you were just too lazy to to get it out. So you're just rich, I think. At that point, that's rich to me. It's not that I'm rich; it's that I'm stupid with money. I make enough money to afford a fifteen dollar movie that it's you not. You spent fifteen, but it's only three bucks, right? You're exaggerating. You didn't spend fifteen. No, it's fourteen ninety nine to own. Well, I'm not gonna oh, rent a movie that I will oh, watch you... again. Oh, you own. Oh, you fucking bought it. Wow. That's well, to me, that's where mathematically or, you know, monetarily, I'm like, why rent a movie for four dollars? That's a movie I'll, I will watch again for 15 and the 15 has the extras. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I have never been that crazy with money that I'd buy something where there's a DVD right there. That's insane to me. But I do think this year I've been renting a lot of movies and the kind of family I come from. I think it's a lot of families. The idea of renting a movie it's crazy to so many people. Like, all, you know what I mean? They're like, don't rent that. We'll just yeah, watch well, something free on the streaming sites. You're referring to Jews, I think is the term <laughs> you're looking for. Certain people I grew up with <laughs> that are like a little conscious of money more so than other people. That community goes insane at the idea of renting a movie. And I say, fuck that, because people are so afraid to rent movies now. They just decide to watch something based on what's available on Netflix. Or H and I think that's bullshit. You shouldn't be limiting yourself to what is streamable. You should rent what you want to rent. You know what I mean? I completely agree. But so, anyways, I, I went off. I took us off the rails there. But yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So Reservoir Dogs again. All of these movies I've seen probably forty times. I mean, like yeah. I was obsessed with Quentin Tarantino as a kid, as a high school kid. And um, Reservoir Dogs, like most people, I feel like like the majority of people, I watched after Pulp Fiction. Oh, interesting. You watch, yeah. oh, right, because Pulp Fiction became popular, then you go back. Yeah, I, in fact, I think for the, the majority of people that are like, I saw Reservoir Dogs first, most of those people are lying. I mean, I think like 50,000 yeah. people saw it at first. Yeah, because you would have to, A, be pretty old, older, I guess, and really know the Sundance movies. Because I guess Reservoir Dogs wasn't that popular, right? No, I think it was like an independent movie. I mean, it's like considered like the independent movie. Um, it, it feels like a student film, honestly. Yeah, but it's it's not. They raised my. I think Harvey Keitel's somebody's wife knew Harvey Keitel. Somehow it got to Harvey Keitel, and then he kind of fronted some money. But that He's is a producer. interesting. That is interesting. Yeah, I saw him on the list. That is interesting. You say that. You're right. Reservoir Dogs is always something people go to after Pulp Fiction. Similar to a lot of the other directors, Wes Anderson. You 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 get introduced to him through uh, Rushmore, and then you might see Bottle Rocket eventually. Yes. And same thing with P.T. Anderson, you're introduced through Boogie Nights, and then you go eventually see Hard Eight, his first movie. So all those directors, they really crush it with their second movie. That's like their big time thing. I think Taxi Driver's like that with Scorsese too. People saw Mean Streets after Taxi Driver. Oh yeah, I guess for us, they're all classics by that point. But yeah, right. you're probably right from that generation. So you like, so with Reservoir Dogs, I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess, for me to really talk about all the movies, I do want to say how I actually feel over, I, I, I want to say how I feel about all the movies just real quickly. Sure. I think they're all very entertaining. 
I think Jackie Brown is the only one that I connect to on any emotional level. So I feel like that's actually a movie about real people. And the other movies are very fun, but watching them now, they don't feel like they really are about anything. And that's fine, whatever. But for me, I like movies that are about something that have content. And Jackie Brown to me has that content. So watching Reservoir Dogs again, I'm like, there's some funny parts. There's some hilarious parts. Lawrence, uh, what's his name? It's fucking hilarious. Lawrence Tierney. Yeah, he is so funny. I mean, just the, I mean, one of the funniest things ever is just when Steve Buscemi goes, uh, you know, why do I have to be Mr. Pink? And just so quickly, just, he doesn't even skip a beat. He's just like, cause you're a faggot. <laughs> like, it's just so, <laughs> it's like, it's like, he is such a funny character. Yes. Steve. And he's also one of the funniest parts in the history of Seinfeld also. I might based add. On, based on one of my favorite writers, by the way, Richard Yates. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Richard Yates is a great writer, a great novelist. His daughter dated Larry David. Oh, wow. And Larry David based a part on him. He was like a scary, tough guy. And he watched it with like his family. And he literally said after watching it about Larry David, he said, I'm going to kill that guy. I got you watching the Wow. <laughs> oh, I never heard that story. That's yeah. It's rare that I get a Seinfeld story I didn't know, but... I mean, you know that... the movie Revolutionary Road with Leonardo DiCaprio? Yeah, yeah. That's based on his book, which is like one of my favorite book of all time by Richard Yates. Oh, no kidding. Oh, yeah, yeah. we talked about this the other day. You, you, you lost your copy, and I lost my copy of my favorite book. Oh, right, yeah, uh, relationship shit. Um, this is very but, recent for me. Uh, yeah. I just want to say that the, one of my all-time top ten lines, probably top five lines in the history of Seinfeld, is that episode where Lawrence Tierney is playing Elaine's father, and they're both in the bathroom. And Jerry's like, I can't go back out there. And then George, uh, Jerry says, what are we going to say? And George says, we'll tell him we're frightened and we have to leave. <laughs> the, uh, the idea of an adult telling another adult that I am frightened and I have to leave is just he, the best. He's amazing. And he's so amazing in this. Just like from the opening, the, the funniest parts are him. For me, like the opening where he's like Toby Wong. Toby, yeah. the way he's just rambling, it's hilarious. And the part I love so much because he's kind of trying to be this old tough guy, but the part I love so much is when him and uh, Michael Madsen are talking and Chris Penn comes in and Michael Madsen starts fucking with Chris Penn and Lawrence Tierney goes along with it. Like the fact that he goes along with it, yes. I find so endlessly amusing. Yeah, he yes ands him. And it's interesting because I always thought this in the movie because you can see a little bit of him being fun and funny there, but when... Tim Roth, Mr. Pink, is talking to uh, his friend, the black, the one black character. He's talking to him. He's like, he's a funny guy. He's like a cool he guy. Say, he's yeah. funny. And, but you don't get to see much of him really being funny. He's pretty serious throughout. He makes a bunch of jokes. Yeah, yeah I was thinking about that because, yeah, he's talking to me. He goes, he's a real funny guy, which you're like, huh, because he's funny to us. He's funny yes. to the audience, but like, it's not like him, except for that one part. Where, where Chris Penn comes in and he, Michael Match is like, we're just talking about how you're a piece of shit and Lord Sarah, you're, you're fucking just, everything up. It, it's just so funny to see someone, an old man, yes, and it's just yes. so funny to see two in a gangster movie like improvise a scene together because <laughs> Lord Sierra is immediately like, well, I hate for you to find it out this way. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. And that's a very human moment in the movie. That's one it of is. the few sections where you can really see there's a relationship between them and Michael Madsen, Scagnetti. Also, uh, Michael Madsen said, there's a lot of great funny lines when uh, he calls him asshead. I mean, asshead is such a great uh, insult. <laughs> Chris Penn, first of all, I think Chris Penn is better than Sean Penn. I know you love Mystic River and all this bullshit. Chris Penn is, is so great. great in Footloose, in this movie, all the right moves that you didn't watch, even though we were supposed to. He is fantastic and had a massive heart attack because he had a habit of eating steaks with butter. I thought he was a cook head. No, nah, but that probably he didn't just, help. Was he, but... ju was he just a steak head? Did he just <laughs> eat some steak? <laughs> it's a sad way to go. It was a, um, it was a mistake, I can tell you that. I, uh... Um, yeah, I mean, I love Sean Penn, but Sean Penn is obviously like, they're, they're kind of the opposite of way. Sean Penn is always acting these like big parts and he can change, but Chris Penn, he might not have as much range, but he's very much himself and everything. And it's very raw. It's super fucking raw and it's super gritty. He's like a better version of Tom Sizemore. And he's like, oh, very, but there's a sleaze to him that's so real. You know what I mean? It's like, he is so sleazy in this movie. I've always felt that. 
And he's I, funny too. I, I don't know who's dead. I don't know who's caught. I don't know I don't who's know not. Who's yeah. <laughs> he rhymes. <laughs> he's great. Yeah. Out of the fucking blue. With the Saved by the Bell fucking <laughs> yeah. cell phone. <laughs> the Zach Morris phone. Also, Steve Buscemi is is fantastic in this movie. And yeah, they're all great. I everything's great except for the fact that there's really no. It's not really about anything real. Oh. But, but other than that, it's like so. It is great. It's just like it's just like a, you know, it's a silly story. Now, I don't uh, think there's anything more frustrating than your your critiques that are there's nothing. It's not about anything. It's about guys robbing a fucking bank, and no. there's a, there's an informant, and and one of them's a rat, one of them's a cop. The guy's a cop. He took a big risk, and there's I mean, another cop. I'd say what it's about on some level, which is interesting. I'd say it's about like masculinity and how all these people are so masculine, they're just destined to just all shoot each other. Like they're so masculine, they almost have to kill each other by the end, you know? That's and it's obviously, it's obviously about, you know, it's obviously the center of the movie is Harvey Keitel's relationship with Tim Roth. There is stuff in it, but it's always very much like a movie. You know what I mean? It's always in the world of like um, uh, a lack of, believability about what's happening, which is fine. It's, I mean, Tarantino is very stylized, but we're talking about which movie, we're, the, the whole point of this is talking about which is the best movie. And for me, like going, when we get to Jackie Brown, I just want to say what is kind of missing from the other movies, which I still think are good. You know what I mean? Yeah. For me personally, which is just that it is ultimately Tarantino so entrenched in the movie world that you're watching very interesting characters, but there's no real, you never feel like they're, um, real i guess on some level and no that, i I agree, I agree with that i definitely think this is the third best movie that we're gonna talk about i yeah. think yeah and, for sure because it, it does have a student film kind of you know right. the suits the men in black suits it looks like you know like you know they're all acting which even there's a part where tim that's like very self-reflexive where tim roth actually is literally preparing for a role right 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 so you kind of it's a wink to the fact that they are actors you know you definitely watch it going that's harvey Keitel playing some new version of uh i think the black suits kind of hurt it looking back on yeah well first of all this came out before men in black i think it's important <laughs> to say that i mean blue if you said blues brothers suits i would make a little more sense <laughs> if they all had the hats on it would be fucking hilarious but the suits are a think, little silly but also don't you feel like and this is part of a larger conversation you feel like a movie has to be about something like something deeper masculinity or 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 fucking consumerism or capitalism whatever this is a movie about robbers some movies are just a caper it's it's a it's a caper without the cape uh, you know it's it's a robbery right. movie and the robbery so that's what it's about it's about a bunch of guys that don't know each other and they each have a relationship with these one common person yeah and it's, trying a to fun, it's a fun rob i totally think it's a fun bank robbery movie i'm not disagreeing with that Right. right. Don't call me a cock or attack me, all the people. I'm not agreeing. I, I do think that. I just think we do look at Tarantino as one of the great filmmakers. So putting it in relation to that and his potential, I think it's somewhat limited in that sense in terms of being like moving in any way. But yes. like, I, I do agree. think it's I do think it's fun. Um, there's a couple of hilarious parts. I guess I sometimes I wish there was more of the hilarious parts than the other parts. But like, you know, the, the hilarious, it's kind of a little like Goodfellas where if like the hilarious parts are kind of come out of nowhere a little. Like, I mean, the part where they're all arguing about the names is so unbelievably funny. Yeah, Mr. And Brown's just, a little too close to Mr. Shit. <laughs> it's just so, enough with the names. We, you can't be that because we have another, <laughs> we have another, what does he say? You got to, right. he's That's like, a, we have a. He's a, a guy in another job is Mr. Brown <laughs> or whatever. Or Mr. Purple. He, He's like, he also, Mr. Guy in another job is Mr. Purple. You're Mr. Pink. He also said like a line that's just really funny and revealing a whole other scenario where he's like, I'm not letting you choose your names. We've already, I've already done this before and it was a disaster. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's hilarious. <laughs> Everybody's fighting over Mr. Black. <laughs> it just makes you think of that, that scene. It's like he's already tried that. Yeah, so there's like, that's what's interesting about Tarantino. The characters are very much just movie characters. They're not real. And yet within that lack of reality, there's this nuance, right. you know? That's what's interesting. I mean, like, he's like, this. the plot is so much not like a real thing. It's not an actual, you know, people are dressed in the same suits uh, and all that shit. But like, there, he puts nuance into clearly movie characters, which is, right. which is in, that's what's kind of cool. There are moments where you're like, 
oh, you're seeing them have a conversation at a restaurant before the bank robbery. Right. It's not like Goodfellas where you're seeing a real like conversation. This is like a real conversation spoken by characters in a movie. Right. Well, that there's a that's also hilarious too, but to rob a bank all in the same uniform, which makes it that much easier to find anyone that gets away. Like, yeah, he's dressed like this. Look for this guy. Well, here's the other thing that I actually think it's, if you think about it, it's the craziest kind of hole in the movie. I, I guess I, I thought about it and then there's a possible explanation, but what about this? They're following them. Like, Tim Ross is following them, right? He has all the information on all of them. Yes. He knows they're all planning a robbery. Of course. They can arrest them at any moment. He's met Joe. He's met all of them. Even with all that information, they let them put guns into the public. <laughs> they let them go into a bank and like put people, hold people hostage. Right. Well, you have to catch them in the act. I mean, that's what a sting is. You can't sting them beforehand. Well, you can, you can't catch them planning a robbery. <laughs> no. Well, you want to get you got to get the crime. You got to get the breaking and entering. You got to get the intent. You got to let them leave with it to commit the felony. I don't the part, think you you're would. You're on to something. You're on to something almost where they leave him in there for so long. And then when Joe finally gets there, the whole thing is he says to the other cop, you know, Freddie Newendike and, uh, you know, yeah. Marvin Nash, he says, you know, we're just waiting for Joe to stick his fat head in the door. The real flaw is Joe comes in. And he's there for like eight minutes before yeah. all the cops get there. Like it's a it's a really long time. Right when Joe gets in and has enough time to do a Mexican standoff, then we break in. <laughs> yeah, and have, we have a back and forth and everything. But now, what about? Um, but I still think you wouldn't let. You can still just arrest people for planning a robbery, go put them to jail. I don't think you're supposed to like let criminals put guns to civilians' heads and put their lives in danger just to give them a higher sentence. Don't you think that's crazy? No one, um, like, cops undercover, if there was, I'm just saying, whatever, it doesn't matter, it's like a comic book movie, but in reality, you arrest those people, you don't let them put guns and, you well, don't let them try to kill people. This is the plot of The Departed, also, you have to build a case, like, in The Departed, he watches, like, seven people get murdered, and, and same which with- I, Yeah, which I say they have a case in this, you have them all- going to rob the bank they have the case I, don't, it, yeah, it, it becomes harder i think uh and i don't know i'm not a legal expert here but i think it becomes harder to win the case because you can have someone defend like well we, you can't prove it. a lot of that's circumstantial well he like said we he was going to rob a bank yeah he was at a right. diner with a gun like well you can't go you can't get someone for breaking and entering and, ro and bank robbery if they're sitting in a diner with a gun going now oh, we're going to go rob this bank it's going to be fun you uh, have yeah. to have them do the activity well, they really fucked up those cops because they got well, a lot of people killed. <laughs> that's part of it because Michael Madsen goes on a kill crazy rampage. I mean, that's right. part of the, the plot. Now, what about the great foreshadow in the opening scene? Ooh, well, let me think about the foreshadow. Oh, where, where he puts the gun and points and, and doesn't No, no, him. that's hack. That's hack. You're above that. You're better than that. Well, I mean, that is foreshadowing. Doesn't he point the gun? I know, but of course, like yeah. my, my fucking nephew is like, oh, I wonder if something's right, going to shoot. Hold on. I didn't know I'd put it on the spot. So foreshadowing, fuck, foreshadowing, uh, for something big in the movie? Big foreshadow opening scene. Oh, Lawrence Terry tells Chris Penn to shoot this fucker to Harvey Keitel. No, you stink. Well, that, that's, that's pretty big foreshadowing right there. Yeah, but that's obvious. The, the subtle one, the subtle foreshadow in the opening scene is Lawrence Tierney goes to pay the bill and he comes back and he says, who didn't tip? And Mr. Orange, the rat, says oh, Mr. He rats Pink. Him out. <laughs> he rats him out. And he says, how come you don't tip? And he says, he doesn't tip. So Mr. Orange immediately is ratting out Mr. Pink in the opening scene. That's hilarious. All right, I got one for Pulp Fiction. Not a foreshadow, but you might not read. I don't know. We'll, we'll wait for that. That's another, hilarious. Another moment like that is um, the cops, when the cops are following him, remember when he comes down from the apartment and he goes, you're a Beretta, and he gets in the car with them, yeah. which is another hilarious, one of the funniest scenes ever where they're talking about oh, yeah. uh, Pam Greer, ironically. Very, very problematic conversation. The cops, <laughs> yeah. They are not politically correct. <laughs> the cops follow. He says, you got to have rocks inside of your head the size of Gibraltar. There's a yeah. balloon bouncing down the street, and it's an orange balloon. At that point, it's still a mystery who the, the rat is. Did you figure this out, or are you just telling me what Tarantino said on DVD commentary? The orange balloon <laughs> I figured out on my own. I was like, oh, wow, that's orange. That's fun. The foreshadow, someone might have told me that one. That one I don't. That's Remember. great. I love that. The opening diner scene is fucking amazing. It it's is great. It's hilarious. You see all their characters right away. Uh, like just all of them, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know, just Michael Madsen, Chris Penn, where you're just like, I don't even have a, I don't even know a Jew with some balls to say. Yeah. How many dicks <laughs> is that? Eddie Bunker? A lot of dicks. Who is the, who is the other guy? I mean, I, I assume he's some kind of legend of something. That's what I thought, too. I have no idea. I actually thought that today. <laughs> I was watching Blue, it. Right? It's Mr. Blue, right? I was like, Blue? I should look him up. Yeah, Mr. Blue. I assume he's in some old spaghetti western that Tarantino loves. I, I also think watching Reservoir Dogs in the beginning, it's kind of cute. You realize that Tarantino is probably like a lonely kid. And he just created a group of friends he can hang out with. Right. Because he's like talking to all these people who are actors he probably loved. And then he gets to like walk with them in the beginning. It's yeah, like yeah, he created yeah. his own group of friends, you know, which, which is, is very great. adorable. Great opening scene. Also interesting about this movie, zero women in the, in the film. Zero. Because Tarantino eventually becomes a fairly diverse director. Like, oh, yeah. And well, very black. I mean, very black. I mean, so many black, great roles for black people. And this is like, this is this is one white movie. <laughs> um, well, th there is also one of the best, line, maybe my favorite line of the whole movie is from the black guy. And he goes, you got to know if some low life sprayed diarrhea all over one of the toilets. <laughs> that's a great line. Um, yeah. Also, this is the only Tarantino movie that's like 90 minutes. Like he does almost exclusively yeah. two and a half hour movies yeah it's beautifully short it's like you can really watch it in like one sitting I, it's hard to watch like jackie brown's almost three hours but yeah it's beautifully short there's a lot of great twists and turns yeah i mean you know i think it's a very it's an extremely well-made movie and there's a lot of fun uh, and the i honestly the part there are a, even though it's so stylized there are some legitimately disturbing parts like the part with the ear is really fucked up I mean, obviously, but it still seems fucked up. Like, I guess as a kid, I wasn't as disturbed by it. I think when you get older, I may be less, I'm more disturbed by violence. And watching it now, it's pretty like... Pussy. <laughs> well, you're just seeing like the, I mean, it's no home alone. It's not that, <laughs> but you're seeing, you're seeing like, you know, he's just a sadist and he like really enjoy, like, he's like really enjoying it. And it's kind of fucked up to see you know yeah he's a psycho but you know what you're not thinking about and as i think you should as a progressive liberal person is that maybe he had some problems when he was raised his parents were probably abusive clearly he's the product of abuse it's true and i'm kink shaming i'm kink i mean if someone likes to cut someone's ear off to get off i shouldn't you know i shouldn't judge that yeah exactly <laughs> by the way I, I only do one great impression in my life i do a couple actually the jetsons vehicle but i do a great mr do orange of the jetsons vehicle <laughs> it's pretty good. Mr. Orange. I can't do it because I can't yell, but I've always been very good at fuck you. I'm fucking dying. I'm yeah, fucking it's dying. It's good because it's a very strange accent. Uh, well, it's it's a British accent that he's a, trying to mask, so it comes it, out a little weird sometimes. It's like a British trying to do New York or, or, or Brooklyn, trying to do like, it seems like a British guy trying to do uh, a Brooklyn accent or something, right? I think he's just trying to do like a flat American I'm fucking accent. Dying here. <laughs> I'm fucking dying. I'm fucking dying. <laughs> Motherfuckers, like, I'm trying to watch The Lost Boys. <laughs> That's an interesting reference there, too. Yeah, it comes out pretty strong in a couple scenes. Very strong, you know? Yes. But, um, Particularly the commode scene, where he's on in front of the graffiti yes. wall talking. That's when it comes out a bunch. Ironically, the part where he's literally preparing a role and, like, acting, that's the part where he really loses the accent the most in the movie. Or um, Also... Is there any risk of the commode story being heard twice? Like I always thought that, I was thinking. Like I was he's thinking. got a script. He's like, you got to use the commode story. And like, what if he's at a bar and they're just like, oh my god, this guy's doing the commode story? It's like a comic. He gets called out on doing the same bit, but like, no, he could get killed that way. He's like, I heard this from this other guy. It turned out to be a rat twelve years ago. You know, let's fucking kill him. Yeah, because it's the point of the story, right? Is is, is good to show that he's he he can't. Uh, uh, what's what's the phrase? Under pressure. Uh, crack something under pressure crack, crack under pressure yeah he can't like crack under pressure but yeah i mean i i would think they should do i think if you're doing undercover i think you should do a different story for each yeah it should and, definitely not be such a huge story that they call it the commode story yeah and it's a script that's like beat up like it's clearly <laughs> like i just gave this to ted he just gave it back to me i really nailed somebody Lord Thierry. That's why he wasn't 100% on it. He's like, I wasn't 100%. I had he heard told the, the story that I've heard three time. times. <laughs> I mean, I know he improvised a couple different parts, but it was the same. <laughs> um, all right, we should move on yeah. to Pulp Fiction, which I, this one I'm nervous about because I feel like you're going to say some bullshit. I, I just, I, it's the most entertaining movie ever that's about nothing. And like, it's great, it's just, I, you know, 
And that's fine, but it, it is, it does like leave you with nothing. It doesn't really leave you with anything, but it's very exciting. For me, a movie that's impactful is something that like resonates with you after. That movie doesn't resonate, but it's so entertaining. It's just not about anything. Doesn't resonate, dog. Movie. Doesn't resonate, dog. That's how I feel. I think it's, I think it's, I mean, I think it's really good. I mean, I don't really, that's something I always felt about Pulp Fiction. I'm like, because people treat it like a film classic, right? It is a classic. It is a film classic, right? Yes. So when I think of a film classic, I think that it's about something. And I watch Pulp Fiction, I'm like, this isn't really about anything besides just that it's entertaining, which is fine, but like, I guess- uh, Well, it's fine or it's not fine. It sounds like you're saying it's not fine. It's that I keep on saying, <laughs> I feel like it's, yeah. uh, it's so, fine. But <laughs> to you, it's uh, not fine. It's a problem. It's not fine. I think it's a problem. I think it's a fuck. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to like, I'm trying to be wishy-washy because your people attack. If, I, I think it's an overrated movie and I don't think it's about anything. Well, first of I all, think- anyone watching this now is not my people. It's our people at this point. Right. We're eight episodes in. So this our is now people. fans of, of the show. Right. You're right. You're right. Okay. So, so yeah, I think it's overrated. I think, I just don't think it's about anything. There's nothing to connect to it. The whole arc with Samuel Jackson isn't like a real thing. It's not like a, it's just like slapped on there. There's not, what is it? Do you think the movie's about something? It's 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 weird because I think we have to be more clear, have a different language, because you want there to be some deeper meaning. Like to me, it's about low rent hitmen and one is at a fucking crossroad in his life. It's about a shitty boxer who's, you know, uh, taking a chance to win this money. It's about a mob boss. It's about his wife. It's about a lot of things. Well, it's about a heroin thing. addict. I, I mean, it's I, about a lot of things. I guess I don't think the stories connect really. In a way, I mean, in a way, I think Reservoir Dogs probably has is a little more about something. Like, in a way, the relationship between Tim Roth and Harvey Keitel, Harvey Keitel and Reservoir Dogs, where they do establish this loyalty to the point where Chris Roth, uh, Tim Roth actually admits he's a rat, which is a kind right. of this level of loyalty. I think that relationship you don't see anywhere in, in Pulp Fiction, really. I, I just don't think, I, I don't think there's like an emotional core to the movie. I think. I think once again, it's uh, there's amazing moments of seeing people talk. What do you the the nuance of not real characters, right? Because these are like fake hitmen, but, but like can't, they have like a Seinfeldian conversation. It's very Seinfeldian, I feel like. But can't be there be different kinds of movies? Again, like this movie is fun. There's some action. There's a lot of jokes. There's some. Uh, it's incredibly stylistic. It's incredibly uh, influential. The music is great. There's a lot of great stuff. But maybe it's not, you know, where, you know, no country for old men is about an old man coming to grips with that. He's too old for the job. And so there's a lot. There's a lot of like emotion, a lot of life experience in it. Like there's yeah. like no so life experience in this movie. <laughs> it's about like, more than it. Because there's also horrible movies like Avatar to me is about the Iraq war. It's really right. about this other thing, but it's so heavy handed and obvious yeah, and it's preachy and, and it's yeah. this blue bullshit. So to me, that's a movie that's about something that's fucking, it's so over the head that it's retarded. And I think it yeah. stinks. But, but like, so th- yes, but I guess you could be both. That's what I think. I think a superior movie would be both. Goodfellas is so entertaining. And yet it really is about, you know, this world of like capitalism where people, value materialism so much to let people die as an afterthought you know what i mean and just kind of avoid it so and you feel that you feel that moral consequence you know there's no moral consequences in this movie no you know which is fine I, i'm sorry i keep on saying which is fine i'm just saying which is it reminds me of big lebowski <laughs> which is cool it's cool you know? man. <laughs> well i i don't want to come off as like such a dick where i'm like i don't allow this to be entertaining i'm just trying to articulate exactly it is entertaining, but it could have been more. It's so entertaining, but I think movies can be more than just entertain, more than just pure entertainment. I think they can all be entertaining and have you connect to the characters. For me, a big thing is learning something about the characters. I think that more than even, a, I don't need it to be about some crazy theme. Learning about the characters, looking at the characters in one way in the beginning and looking at them in a different way by the end and your perception of them changing, I think that means a lot to me. That that's kind of where I I get a lot out but, of movies. And but, I know you're going to say Samuel Jackson has an arc. But no, it's that's not, not what I'm going to say. Yeah, and okay. I, I've been I've insulted that you tried to. All right, sorry. Whatever. Sorry. But what about? I mean, so the, a, a fascinating relationship in the movie is the relationship between Marcellus Wallace and and, 
and Bruce Willis, uh, Butch Coolidge. I mean, that's a great relationship in the beginning. You know, he's standing there, by the way, where he shot Two Face, by the way. He's going to trade. He's going to fuck him up. What? Uh, Butch, in the opening scene where they're talking. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's telling him to take a dive. Yeah. Butch is shot in a way that it's like fully divided in half. It's like he's half in the shadow, half lit. So there's some sort of. And, and in the whole time he's telling him this, he's planning on double crossing him, obviously, and not taking a dive. It's also the reverse of the thing with Christopher Walken, where it's from the POV of Ving Rams. Right. So Christopher Walken from the POV of Bruce Willis. There's a lot of like just one shot where you hear the, the voiceover. And- Which I, I want to talk about that scene, the Christopher Walken scene, because that to me is the best scene in the whole movie and maybe Tarantino's best scene. But so that's a whole thing where he he's this guy. He's this he's working for this mob boss. He's going to take a dive. And instead, he defies him. And now he's being chased by this guy. He's like, we're going to kill him no matter what. We're going to find him. Eventually, he personally finds him. They're in a fist fight. They're going to kill each other. And then he rescues him. And now, you know, Butch is free because he saw the one thing that would save him is this guy getting anally raped in the ass. Um, (laughs) So now he's been saved. So now by the end of the relationship, they have this deep connection. And in some ways, he has a deeper connection with him than anybody in his it's life. It's like going to kid. war. It's, it's not a deep kid. It's just like an insane it was, thing. It's, it's it just insane. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> but he it's has the ultimate insane. secret. He shares the secret with one other human. He's not going to go home and tell Mia Wallace that he got fucked in the ass by a Right. Yeah, cop. they have a secret, but it's like, I don't know if it's like this big moment in their relationship where they're like deep, deep soulmates or he's going to write him a card every year. I still haven't told anyone you got raped. Well, that is a big, it is a deep relationship because that's what allows him to get off. That's the only thing that would have saved him. I mean, that's what's so interesting about it is that you have this situation where a guy is going to kill a guy. He's going to hide in a bowl of rice and N word. Yeah. It's going to whatever, no matter what we're scouring the earth. There's nothing on earth that is going to stop me from killing this guy. And then lo and behold, (laughs) he he ends up in this situation. And now they've equally, they have an equal respect for each other at the end. It's sort of, it's almost like a relation. They have more in common than fucking Casablanca than, than Rick and uh, whatever her name is at the end of that movie, they have this mutual respect. All right, what I'm gonna say is gonna piss you off. But here it is. I find that whole sequence uncomfortable and like- Well, of course it's uncomfortable. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, you're not supposed to be like, yeah, you're not supposed to- I, you're I couldn't jack up. off to it at all. I tried and I failed. I don't, the, 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 okay, so there's an issue I have with Pulp Fiction, which- um, You just don't like interracial sex. That's your problem. <laughs> Have you seen it recently? I guess you know it very well, right? Yeah, I watched it very recently, yeah. And I've seen it, I mean, a thousand times. I'm not against showing racism in movies if it feels like it's a real thing and you're trying to make it real. You know what I mean? I'm not. I think this movie is sometimes more racist than real life. And maybe times have just changed, but to me, having Vince uh, Ving Rhames, having him come in there, having the guy in the shotgun say, get your foot off that n-word yeah having them tie them both up and then having him say eeny miny catch a n-word by the toe and then raping them this black guy and then having bruce will save him with a sword i don't know i just felt it feels uncomfortable now i guess it feels like like it felt icky to me you know i don't know maybe just times have changed but the use of the n-word in this movie does i mean well, to me, the, the part where Quentin Tarantino is talking to Samuel L. Jackson is like very, it is, does not hold up. That is hard to watch. Wait, which scene? I mean, I'm. Oh, oh, oh Jimmy. Uh, yeah. I see. I mean, that um, part is like, it is like, and I'm not saying to blame Tarantino. I'm not like, I don't think you should. I'm not about cancel culture or whatever. I, I, obviously, people weren't as, or white people weren't as offended at the time. So clearly, times have evolved. But when you're watching like, this white director in the movie calling Samuel Jackson the N-word and Samuel Jackson not getting upset. He's not calling him the N-word. He's calling he's Marvin the N-word. It. Well, but he's still say- Were people not offended by the N-word in the 90s? Like- No, people were. I mean, Spike Lee has been up in arms for a long time. They're just- I hate to say this, media. but I, I hate to say this, but I agree with Spike Lee. I think if you, first of all, obviously you could never get that done today. Like I'm going to, ask a black guy to be in a movie I'm making and I'm going to star in it or I'm going to be in a scene in it where I say the n-word in front of him while yelling at him you know I think that's a little I, it is uncomfortable to watch now but like I guess to me it's like 
it's okay to show racism in a movie, but sometimes if you're showing it to the point where it's not believable, I don't think it's believable that Tarantino would say the N-word in front of this hitman just because they're business partners. Well, they're friends. I mean, so they're they're close friends. I mean, also, I'm friends with black people. I don't say the hard N-word. Yeah, so <laughs> say, you know. like, just because I'm friends. You know, but I mean, so you could maybe, say the N word around black people. I'd be friends with so many of them just to do it. You know. Okay, so let's let's go back to <laughs> but yeah, let's the scene go back, that you started because that yeah. scene I'll defend in that you're like they, they they're saying the N word casually. They're psychopaths. <laughs> they're they're people that fucking abduct people and then rape them for fun. And I have to assume kill them afterwards. They have a guy bound in leather that lives in a box. So for them to use the N-word, you have no case there. This is a horrible argument. The, the one where Jimmy, the character Jimmy saying the N-word, you might have something. But these two rapist psychos, you want them to be like politically correct. As say. <laughs> They've captured a guy. They're going to kill him. He's, he's bound and gagged. And my, my thing is like how it definitely often makes they... the white guy look pretty cool, like the savior. He takes the sword and saves the black guy from getting raped. It does seem to me there's a little of this kind of like making the white guy look really cool and the black guy kind of look really emasculated. Well, everything leading up to that though, the white guy's a loser. He's a shitty fighter who's gonna take a dive for the black guy. I mean, the black guy's a mob boss. He's like he lives in the Hollywood Hills. He has a hot wife. Yeah, but he goes through a lot. He gets beat up by Bruce Willis. He gets punched a bunch and then like just raped. It's just a lot of shit that happens to Vic Rams. And at a certain yeah. point, you're like, boy, does this white guy look like a savior in this moment. And boy, did they take one of the two black guys and really demean him in the movie while the other black guy gets yelled the N-word at him. I mean, I just think the implication that like somehow Tarantino is racist or something is silly. Like later, I mean, uh, Sam Jackson's character completely undresses a white guy later in the movie. And it's, yeah. I mean, it's the best that that actually probably is the best scene in the movie and goes, you're the weak. Right. I'm the strong. Like, so, I mean, you can counterbalance all of the race stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I just felt a little uncomfortable watching it now. I don't know. That, I mean, that's fair. I mean, the, the, the den, dead maybe I'm, being a, maybe I'm being a liberal cuck, but I guess I did find it uncomfortable to take this like kind of bigger black dude, right? Make him look cool and then have him, have him call him the N-word twice, then rape him, and then have this white guy save him with a sword. I don't know. It, it feels, I don't think, and I don't think it's something where Tarantino is like, you know, I, I think times change and times evolve, but it felt, it felt, it, it did feel uncomfortable to watch. And the um, scene with Tarantino yelling at Samuel Jackson is feels really gross now. That you have a much better case for. Well, that's why I immediately segued to that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> when we were I talking mean, about it. That one the, is the first like, one, I just, I think you're right about the first one. I think you're making good points. I just personally felt uncomfortable, but I don't think, I think you're right. I don't think, I think it's hard to fully articulate because I, you know, sometimes you have feelings that are against your principles. You know what I mean? Like my principles are the story is a story. You know what I mean? Don't change the story just because you're afraid people will judge it racially. You know, I believe that. Like my buddy wrote a play and they're putting it on and, and about black characters. One black character has Kool-Aid, is drinking Kool-Aid. And the director wanted him, or other people wanted him to change it from Kool-Aid because they thought that'd be too obvious, you know? But it's like black people, some black people drink Kool-Aid. You don't have to like change that. So I don't think like you should change the story to like defend. And, and so I guess if you need Ving Rhames to be raped for the story, but it's still just kind of uncomfortable like watching him go through all that shit. You know? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, but I don't think it's uncomfortable because he's black. I think it's uncomfortable because he's the victim of a fucking horrendous rape. I mean, I think if Ving Rhames was played by, you know, a uh, big white guy, fucking Marlon Brando, who would have been like 800 pounds at that point. <laughs> but whoever, if he was played by whatever white guy, I think the movie would have been pretty similar. I mean, no? I guess, yeah, I guess the part that was just a little too much for me is... They say, get the N-word off my floor, which is, okay, whatever. But then watching it, knowing he's about to get raped, and I forgot the part where the, what's the guy's name? The guy from Usual Suspects? Zed? Zed, yeah. Watching him point, and I guess it's because I know he's going to get raped. Watching him do the finger thing and going, eeny, miny, mo, catch a N-word by the toe. I guess in that moment, also knowing he's about to get raped, it did, I was just like, eh, I don't know. But I, I agree. I, I, I think you shouldn't. Yeah, I'm, you know, I can't, I have cut feelings and I can't help. It. Well, see, the, even that though doesn't, but that <laughs> implies that like I'm conservative because of the stance <laughs> I'm taking. Like I'm like, no way, man. I think we, I think I, we I need get to that fucking... you like seeing black people get raped. It makes you feel more powerful as a white guy. I get that. And that's bad. 
<laughs> I just, I don't, to me, I never thought of it, and I could be ignorant. I don't think Tarantino was trying to make a statement that, like, yeah, the white man fucking is going to save the black guy. You could also make an argument well, that here's, you could also make an argument, by the way, that Zed is in a security uniform. He's in a uniform. A this cop, is, yeah. this is a cop, a uniformed white guy, literally raping. I didn't like, I didn't like what it said about blue lives matter either. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's a person of, of some kind of a stature, uh, some kind of uh, officer literally raping the black guy. All right. So let me take a, let me take one back. Cause you know, I feel like we never agree on here or never like convince each other. I'll admit to you that I just felt uncomfortable, but I'm, it's unfair of me to judge the story for that. Great. I'll agree with that. This is a moment where you convinced me. I appreciate the it. Fucking, the fucking other scene is r insane. Like imagine just now, imagine you just like calling like um, Michael Che and be like, you wanna do the sketch I filmed? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start and say the N-word a bunch and while yelling at you. Like, it's just like, it, but, and, and I get times have changed, but like, there is something a little darker there, I think, from the from Tarantino. It's, it's very dark and it's hard to imagine anyone doing it now. But also, I, I, could, I could be, I could woke back at you and say, now you're speaking for Sam Jackson. He's friends with Tarantino. He agreed to it and he made many more films with him after that. So he's obviously not upset you're by right. that. You're right. I am, you know, I am speaking. You're white splaining. You're right. I can't tell Samuel Jackson I was offended by what you did. You're right. But um, I don't know if Samuel Jackson was fully comfortable. I mean, I think he was going to do the movie anyway. But he was like, comfortable I, with his Academy Award nomination. I'll tell you well, that. Yeah, you're right. And to be fair, Spike Lee, when he got mad, Spike Lee never really used uh, Samuel Jackson in the way Tarantino did. Spike Lee was mad at Tarantino, called him a racist. Samuel Jackson in uh, Spike Lee movies, he's a crackhead in one movie and he's like the radio DJ in the other. So obviously like Tarantino has given, Tarantino has given Samuel Jackson great roles. But I don't think everything's black and white. I don't think it's one way or the other. I think Tarantino writes great characters. I think he can like create amazing characters. And I also think it's possible that there's a part of him that really wants to be black like really wants to be black and kind of maybe resents on some deeper level black people because they're black and he's not. And maybe that's rooted in him dressing him down in that scene. Because there does seem to be in that scene a sense of him showing superiority over this black actor, you know? So I, I don't think it's one way or the other, you know? Well, I think that uh, I understand and it is weird. I mean, now it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hold up great 27 <laughs> years later, um, but it's an extremely memorable line. And at the time, it's it's so egregious that it's funny and it obviously funny. shows thought... that they have a relationship and also he's upset with them like he just showed up at his house i mean yeah. but yeah it is but he's not it like... is insane Sorry. it he's is insane the... to be like this dead yeah. n-word storage i mean it's, yeah. it's insane but that's what the character maybe that character whatever he's but also married yeah. to a black woman that character <laughs> like i said if married to a black woman allows you to do that i'd marry a black woman tomorrow you know i feel like i'm saying worse things than anything i know you're, you're exactly you're worse than tarantino <laughs> tarantino's racist and i got to get to my clan meeting soon so let's <laughs> but look just because now we're uncomfortable doesn't mean like back then black people might have been <laughs> just as uncomfortable back then it's just like we're catching up i don't know i'm not speaking for black people but it does like it does suggest a little of that kind of director being like, I'm allowed to do whatever I want or something or like, you know, or make him feel somehow cooler than a black guy or at least as cool as a black guy or wanting to fit in. I think he always wanted to fit in and be someone else. And you see a little of that maybe resentment under it. But What's interesting is he won the Academy Award for the screenplay. Yeah. They, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, that yeah. I cannot imagine happening now, but he won it again no. for Django, but that was a little more you know, well, whatever. Django, yeah, it'd be hard to have like slave owners be like political. Get that African American and. Well, <laughs> Jackie Brown. I just read this. I, I'm not ready to move on to Jackie Brown yet, but Jackie Brown has the third most N words of any Tarantino behind Hateful Eight and uh, uh, Django. It had, they say it 38 times in that one, and that's the one that really upset Spike Lee. Also, Jackie Brown. Jackie Brown, yeah. But that's all black people say it. Yeah. What? <laughs> so, all but, black people say the Edward. I know, but he's still. By that? But he's still the white guy writing it a ton. Oh, I mean, right, he's right. still oh, right, on right. his computer <laughs> writing the Edward yeah. fucking tons of times. <laughs> oh yeah, they're not well, improvising the movie. <laughs> but hold on, I want to. I want to <laughs> stick with Pulp Fiction because yeah. I want to talk yeah, about. Sorry. I feel like we've barely even talked about Pulp Fiction. Um, 
But the scene, the Christopher Walken scene is amazing and it is hilarious. There's really funny lines, but oh, it also, amazing. to what you're talking about, is like, to me, one of the most poignant scenes ever. There's funny things in it, but it's incredibly beautiful and poignant, this story. The whole story is incredible. And that's a, a deep story about like what a great setup of how much this watch means to this guy that he's going to risk his life for it. Why would you risk your life for this watch? And the story of like an un like to me, that's like one of the most compelling war stories of all time of like <laughs> this thing that's been passed on to generation to generation and giving it to a guy he doesn't know days before he dying. And this guy keeping his promise to deliver a watch to his infant son is so beautiful. And even though it's funny, hiding it up his ass is amazing. Like, what an incredible sacrifice this guy has made for his friend. And, and it is great psychologically because, you know, Bruce Willis feels like such a fuck up in his life and feels like he lacks integrity. And he has this watch, which is just a, a haunting reminder of the integrity, all his, you know, his father, his grandfather, these veterans, you know? Yes. And of course, so he's he, the only one that hasn't been to war. He's the only one that hasn't been to war. And he, here he is just like fucking, uh, you know, just a boxer who's like working, you know, get taking bribes and stuff. And uh, so it, it, it's also possible maybe, maybe it's that watch and that pressure that led him to killing that guy or like, you know, really fighting back in that moment to try to show that he did on some level kind of show that he's a warrior, you know? Yes. And in that moment, he, that, he's thinking about it right before the fight is when he wakes up from thinking about that is that he maybe he's thinking about not doing it. Maybe no, he's going to back yeah. out and take the dive. I think it's great. And I think uh, um, the watch is like his shame. You know what I mean? That he's not living up to his to his family. You know what I mean? And I, right. I, I think that is I think that is powerful. It's a great object. I think the only scene that the movie started to tell you, the one scene that I never understood why it's in there. And it's so boring is a scene with him in the taxi with that foreign yes. woman. I, it's such a boring. It fucks then, up the pace. Yeah, it fucks up the pace. And he already talks to his girlfriend, who's also foreign for a long time. You, yes. You wonder why that I was trying to wonder why it's in there. Yeah. In fact, that's a scene that when I was a kid rewatching, I would always fast forward that scene because I was just like, I don't give a fuck about this. It's the weird fake cab background. As, as a kid, I was always like, oh, this is the boring part of the movie. As a kid, I was like, I didn't know what a lull was, but I'm like, this is the lull. Right yeah. Here. And it's a very long movie and it's not really necessary. And she's kind of into him. She's a bad actor. She's a little over the top. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't get it. I also, here's the other thing I, I have a theory about. Maybe it's obvious, but uh, I feel like there's something they suggest with his girlfriend in the next scene that they don't say out loud. Uh, oh, I don't, I don't know what you're getting to. I don't know. Just, you're going to have to just give it to me because I'm not even <laughs> close. I'm like, I'm like, what? I think she's pregnant. Oh, a pot belly. Well, so there's two things. She's trying to get him to agree that a pot belly is sexy. Right. And then in the next scene, he's about to fall asleep and she goes, uh, she tries to say his name and he's asleep and he, she goes, never mind. Right, she's right. She's about to tell him something. Interesting. Yeah. So, so maybe he's got those two. She's pregnant. Yes. And he's got to get that watch to give to that kid. And then he says, I'd punch you in it also. Maybe that means he'd fucking abort it. <laughs> but that's true. He has the next kid. Yeah. Do you, do you agree with my theory? I think it's a great theory. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a good, a good, good theory. Good point. You see a little bit of his cock after he takes a shower, by the way. Yeah, there is like that, that shot of him walking by. It's pretty hot. Um, he's Giving me oral pleasure. <laughs> She's so cute. I love them two together. It's a great, yeah, it's a great thing them two, and uh, it's cool to show too with Paul Fiction that he also really knows how to uh, write um, women. Like you watch Reservoir Dogs, you're like, this is a guy who's, you know, but he knows how to write good female characters. It's an interesting thing. I always thought, too, it always gave me anxiety when he goes back to pick her up and she won't get on the bike because she's scared. And he's like, get the fuck on. Honey, come on. And I always thought, like, especially this is pre cell phones. Like, what if Marcellus can't get the word out fast enough? Like, that I is know. a scary moment. He's like, I got to catch this train. But you're like, I picture him running into one of Marcellus's guys and he's like, no, no, no. I saw him getting raped in the ass. Don't <laughs> kill me. Like, it's hard back then to get the information out there. Right. And what about this? To add to that, Marcellus agrees to this, but he doesn't know that Bruce Willis just killed one of his best employees. Wait, who did he kill? John Travolta. Oh, right, right. Marcellus, okay. my my, when he finds out one of his like most important, like, you know, uh, I don't know where he's in the hierarchy, but when he finds out Travolta, one of his loyal servants got murdered by him, he might be like, fuck that. 
No, I, I, think, no. I think that's the thing that makes the rape so compelling is that it's bigger than any of that. And I don't think Marcellus gives a shit about him. I mean, he had just got out of jail. I mean, he and also, you know, he took his wife out for a date and he probably thought that was weird. And I don't know. <laughs> well, well, let's talk about the wife on the date because we haven't talked about that. Which is yeah, we haven't even a- talked about Mia Wallace, the one which, fucking woman in the movie who's <laughs> phenomenal. Which is an amazing sequence. By the way, I, there's so many things I love about this movie. I'm just saying, just trying to show what I think it could have been more, but like the scene between him and her is so great. The, the salt, like, first of all, it's interesting that he's, cause as a kid, you watch there's a lot of drug usage and yes. it really makes you, it's very confusing. Cause I, in every other movie, someone takes heroin and they're a zombie in the corner. Right. But he takes heroin and just immediately, he does it very casually. He takes heroin before a date. Right. Well, that's seems thing, like a lot. That's an interesting <laughs> thing about heroin is, I think there's like multiple images of heroin. There's like heroin of people that are like all strung out and poor and it can't afford heroin. So they rob and they steal to get right. their heroin. But then there's people that make money like Anthony Kiedis and fucking Kurt Cobain, people that have money, heroin, it's available. So they're not like losing they're not, all their money. They're not, not buying food. So you can actually, crazy. yeah. So they can have a car and a house or whatever. But yes, I thought the same thing. It's very rare to see heroin depicted of a guy just having a conversation on heroin. Yeah. It seems like, it seems like it, it really feels much more like weed. Cause he takes it and he just like, yeah, I would like, I'm already, already nervous on a date. So I think if I took heroin, I'd be very nervous. I'd like throw up or like, just like collapse or something. It just seems like a lot to bring into like that situation. But I think heroin a car is very irresponsible, by the way, for the yeah. man, to be driving a car on heroin. But I think heroin addicts aren't like, I won't do it now. I'll do it a couple days from now. Like, I think, I think it's kind of like, I got to do heroin so I can go function. Well, I will say it kind of makes heroin look functional, <laughs> which I don't know, maybe it is. I mean, I just, is there any other movie? And I don't know about real, it probably is, you're probably right. Probably Alex Kiedis or whatever did heroin and then, or Anthony Kiedis or whatever did heroin and like, you know, did rehearsal. But like, is there any other movie where someone takes heroin and it isn't immediately just zoned out on like a couch or a bed or something? Uh, Hard to say. Yeah, I don't know. But it is like, he's re- ready to go after that. Yeah. But um, what was I going to say about that fucking scene? Oh, I forget now. Oh, I, I watched on Inside the Actors Studio one time with Travolta. And boy, we got to pick up the pace. We're only on fucking movie two. Oh, we, uh, we got, only got one more. We're good. Um, good point. But it's the one we like the most. Um, but oh, I watched Travolta on Inside the Actors Studio, and he said he talked to a heroin addict, and the heroin addict said the only way to really know what it's like is to do heroin. And Travolta was like, I don't want to do that. And he said, Okay, the closest thing, and I always remember this because I think I was like a teenager when I watched it. He said, You get really like drunk on tequila and then float in like a really hot bath or pool, like a hot tub, mm. or maybe just a warm, maybe a heated pool. He said, I can't remember the exact wordage. And Travolta was like, okay, I can do that. So that's what he did to prep. But I remember being like a teenager and this guy describing being drunk, floating in a warm pool and being like, heroin sounds fucking awesome. Yeah, I mean, like that yeah. sounds really fantastic. It does. As someone who used to be addicted to Vicodin, it seems so intense because I think Vicodin's pretty intense. So it just seems like injecting it. I mean, I did have, I had kidney stones once and they injected me with morphine and it was the greatest feeling I've ever had in my life. Yeah, well, we talked about it the other day. I mean, like I, I've been sober for years and and uh, I, I, I recommend it to everybody <laughs> but that needs it. But the best I've ever felt physically in my life is like one and a half Vicodin and four beers and a cigar. It's incredible. Yeah, it really is. And like, when I got the kidney stones out, because that was an injection. So I, was, I, I went from the worst pain in my life to like the greatest experience, like greatest feeling in my life. So that was just like, cause when it is injected, it is quite, it's quite nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, uh, what were we saying? The heroin and the- The scene, I don't know. We haven't got to the Mia Wallace really at all. Okay, well she also, it's hilarious that she like does coke with so many people around her. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like there's just like 10 people. And the kid I didn't get that. I kid I guess I thought they're all doing coke or something, but they're not. They're just like looking in the mirror and she's just like, wow. Like she, yeah. She's not in a stall. She's just doing coke like right there. <laughs> a funny thing I thought for years, for like from the time I was like 13 until like 30, I thought powder your nose meant do cocaine. It does. 
I mean, I think it can. Does it? I thought it means I mean, like it, put makeup on. Like I think girls say, I'm going to powder my nose. It means like. Well, it, it means that and it's a euphemism for cocaine. Powder my nose, powder in my nose. It's a euphemism, but it can also mean makeup. Well, I thought it exclusively meant cocaine. Oh, you saw it like your mother was like doing cocaine. <laughs> yeah. She went out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I just thought like, oh, that must that means I'm going to go do cocaine. I didn't know because powder my nose, cocaine makes sense. Powder yeah. my nose, put makeup on is fucking stupid. Well, they powder their nose, right? I don't know. But you powder yeah. your whole face, don't you? No, yeah, they never right. say powder anything else. Do you actually put makeup on your nose? Yeah, Should it be like so. powder my cheeks? No, but you put it on your nose too because otherwise you'd just have a different color cheek than nose. Like fucking oh, right. WC but Field. It, but it should be, you're right though. It should be powder my face. Yeah, I'm going to powder my face. But that sounds like someone jizzing on your face. That sounds like that kind of... <laughs> um, Mr. Brown's a little too close to Mr. Shit. <laughs> um, That's a good point. But I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe, you're right. maybe it is. Maybe don't, they don't say it for actual makeup. You know? Oh. <laughs> But know. the most compelling scene of the movie, of course, is the fucking overdose needle in the heart, which taken directly from Scorsese's American Boy documentary. Did you know that? Have you seen that? No, I don't know what you're uh, what you're referring to. So Scorsese made a documentary called American Boy about this guy, um, Prince. Uh, I forget his first name. Freddie Prince Jr. Uh, oh, <laughs> wait, the comedian? No, no, no. That's not oh. really his name. Uh, I'll think of it in a second. Fuck. But he made a documentary about the guy who plays Easy Andy in Taxi Driver, the gu the gun salesman. OK, yeah. So that actor, he's a he was a roadie for Neil Diamond and a heroin addict. And there's a documentary that Scorsese made that just kind of resurfaced on Criterion Channel. I think it's on YouTube also, but it's just him telling stories. And he tells that story from the movie. And Tarantino, being a big film buff, must have seen it and just taken it. So it's a story of just someone OD and them shooting uh, the needle kind of. Yeah. So he's like, I'm, I was hanging out this this woman OD'd and the guy and he talks about the argument, but who's going to give her the shot? And they take the needle and he's oh, like, and you got to pierce it into their heart. And he's like, you're going to give her the shot. He's like, I'm not going to give her a shot. And he, he tells that story. That's it's on my Instagram. Yeah, that, no, that's fascinating. I think uh, it's such a great, you know, in terms of like screenplay writing, in terms of like, you know, what, what they try to do with screenplay writing, like uh, reversal of fortune, you know, a gap of expectation. It's such an amazing gap of expectation, like a joke where he's just like so worried it's going to get sexual and he'll get in trouble. Right, right. And then just like, <laughs> and then just, and what a callback. I mean, there's so many amazing callbacks in that scene between the heroine and the joke at the end and the greatest callback, which is that Eric Stoltz's uh, wife is really into needles. And then she right. gets so excited to see the needle. It's like so many, as a comedian, and like you're like, damn, that's like, that's a lot of callbacks in that story. And it's just so funny, the whole thing, the argument. A felt pen, a fucking black magic marker. So uh, funny. She's fuck. I love her. She's fucking great. They're both so fucking great. And then I, I got I to gotta stab her three times is like the funniest line in the movie. <laughs> stab her three times? No, what's fucking... <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that's the funniest scene? The funniest line? Um... It's so hard to pick one because that's the other thing about this movie. Watching it again, every line is so memorable that whenever there's a line, you just know exactly the next line, exactly what it's going to be. Like, right, all right. So equally memorable. Yeah, no, it's amazing. But that whole sequence is so fucking dramatic. It makes my heart pound still. And the fun fact that I'm sure people know is that they never show the needle piercing the skin. It gets close and it cuts and just goes. Thud and makes that noise. So people, I think, think they see it going in, but they don't. Like the shower psycho scene where they think exactly. they see tits, but they don't. You know what I noticed in that scene also, which I just never noticed, is that that other girl is in the scene. Did you notice that? Yeah, she Trudy. Just wake, she just wakes up from the couch and is just looking. I just never saw that. Yeah. And you're watching again. She just literally, you just see her wake up and look over in the background the whole time. It's very bizarre. The um, one issue I have with it is that it, it's, upon rewatching it, is like, it's a little overly staged after she wakes up, they all move back and then all move in together. Yeah. It's like a little bit a little like, all right. yeah. That it's also a great moment that cut from her when she says, say something and she says something and then a cut to just a silent car ride. And she's like overly yeah, she pale. Looks, white she beautiful. looks exactly like Winona Ryder and fucking Edward Scissorhands or yeah. something. She just looked, well, you know, it's funny you say Courtney because what's so it, I, I did, it does remind me so much of Seinfeld in a way where to the point where it's like, it's like he took stickiness and he made it really raw and gritty. 
but it's right. still the tropes of stickiness where they're having a conversation about a foot massage before they get into shoot the guys and like them arguing about the pen. It is shtick. Right, right. But it's right. done in this kind of gritty, modern kind of uh, uh, aesthetic. But it is ultimately at, the, at its core shtick. You know. And isn't it going back to what it's about? I mean, isn't it about these underbelly people, these sort of forgotten by society people, every character in no, the movie in so many ways? I don't think so. I don't think it's about anything. I mean, maybe in the same way. Well, neither is Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Yeah. yeah, maybe the same way Seinfeld. I don't think it's about anything because you can't say it's about a moral arc at him with Samuel Jackson because that's just kind of silly, that whole thing. And also it's like, He's having a moral arc, but he doesn't seem to care that they blew that guy's head off. You know what I mean? And like the movie is like nihilism, you know, like no one actually like, you know, John Travolta, you think they have a relationship, you know, and then she ODs and he doesn't give a shit about her. He's just purely worried for himself. You know what I mean? Like it's all kind of nihilistic where people just murder people, but then care equally about, you know, Burger King and shit. Another great line, just. What was Burger King like? I don't know, I didn't go there. It's just, once again, just such a real, like real moments and fake situations. That's what it is. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's just brilliantly written. It's so memorable. The music is great. Every character is so fucking cool. It's sexy, it, it, it's uh, thrilling. Yeah, it's and just not about anything. You can't tell me it's about something, but I can agree I just it's one don't... of the most entertaining movies. You can't I, say it's about underbelly, whatever, you know. I know. I just think that you have this weird language. I mean, like, it's about a fucking hitman. It's about the wife of a mob boss. It's about a boxer. It's about, you know, I, I don't understand. It's not about anything. But even an ensemble movie, sometimes, they're, like, the characters are thematically linked in some way. I don't think there's really any... You don't think they're themes. thematically linked? I mean, I think they're linked, <laughs> I mean, like, like <laughs> plot-wise. But, like, I don't think they're linked, like, with themes. I think, you know... I think the ultimate theme of the movie that just every scene is like a long conversation and then it erupts in violence or ODing essentially. But like, I don't think, I, I, I just think it's a purely entertaining movie. And when, so when someone says it's your favorite movie, I'm kind of like, I would want my favorite movie to be a little more a reflection of things in real life. But there is obviously great moments. I love the moment just when they're hitting and going up to the door. Cause that's, you know, it's like almost like you took a movie that's fake and you showed like a conversation right before it. Like you never see the conversation with the hitman going up to the door. And the part that they're just not there on time and then they hold back and they go into the hallway and continue the conversation. Right. Those are the moments I love where you just see this realness in a fake scenario. I guess that's, I think ultimately that might be the theme that you're watching uh, a, a nuance in a, in, a, in a clearly cinematic world that's not trying to be like real life, you know? Yeah, I mean, we 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 got to move on. But the nuance uh, is the style. What's that? The nuance, the the theme is the style. What yeah, it's I about mean, is its style itself, which is I I think that's what it's about. It's not about morality. It's definitely not about morality. Like the whole is, thing with Samuel so Jackson is not a, you know. Is hateful aid about something? I didn't really. I I don't know. I watched that movie in theaters and I didn't really. I wasn't crazy about it. Did I, you like it? The, I like it enough. I don't, I don't, it's not I'll, as great. I'll tell you what, some, what a movie's about something. Fucking Jackie Brown. Yes, Jackie let's move Brown. into Jackie Brown, which Jack I do think is the best of these movies. You do? Yeah, well, I don't know about the best. I thought, I I mean, thought I'm going to argue about this. I thought this was... It's hard to say because... I do. Ultimately, it's like, I know what you mean. Like, there is more, there's so much depth to Jackie Brown, but Pulp Fiction is funner. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard Pulp to Fiction is definitely this more is, fun. But. This is where it gets tricky with with best and favorite, because a lot of times I'm like this with sports when people are like, what's your favorite sport? And I'm like, whatever sport I'm watching, like I watch hockey and I'm right. like, this is the greatest. I watch you would not understand this, but for people that <laughs> I, mean, I understand what sports are, but like I'm watching college football and I'm like, this is better than anything in the world. I'm watching right. the World Series. I'm like this. So when I'm watching Pulp Fiction, I'm like, this is the fucking best movie right. I've ever seen in my life. And then like, Jackie yeah. Brown it is. It, it's like when you watch a great comic, the, the best comics are the ones where when you're watching them, you're like this is the best comic of all time when right. you're in the middle of watching them, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, th that you're right. And Jackie Brown is slow. There are slow parts. There are fucking lulls. And like literally Pulp Fiction has one scene that's a lull. Like one. Every other scene right. is the most entertaining thing ever. But for me, when you talk about like the characters being linked in Pulp Fiction, they're only linked by the style. And Jackie Brown, they're actually all linked by the theme of getting older they're all past their prime. Like pretty much everyone in the movie is past their prime on some level. And so you're watching this movie about older people. 
And that's what's interesting. To me, Reservoir Dogs is like a college movie. Pulp Fiction is like a movie in your 30s. And Jackie Brown is like a movie in your 50s. There's like a maturity in Jackie Brown you don't see in the other movies. And I, I am more connected emotionally in the opening scene of just the credits of Jackie Brown. I'm more connected to that emotionally than anything in any other Tarantino movie we've talked about. What about this interesting thing that I noticed last night? I watched it last night for the fucking 900th time. Um, the opening sequence, I thought this, um, speaking, of, speaking of thematic things, is the opening scene, you know, of course, which is mirroring right. The Graduate. The Graduate, yeah. So she's on the escalator and life is, the escalator is just pulling her through life. It's whatever background. She's not doing anything. She's just kind of following the escalator. And then later when she's walking in to finally take the money, it's the same shot, except she's power walking. Yeah. Where now crazy. she's finally taking some action. She's doing the moving. Really? She's doing well, the yeah. Great point. She's taking control of her life. Right. She's trying to make, yeah, it's a great point. And that's why I, I think that's great. And that's why I find the opening so moving in a way that like, I just, cause I watch Rather Dogs, it's fun. I watch Pulp Fiction, it's fun. I turn on Jackie Brown, I want to cry. You see this older black woman, an amazing fucking song, just such a powerful song. And you see how tired she is and she's going through all these people and she's on this walkway of life that's just like kind of keeping her stuck in the motions, you know? And then rushing to her uh, job as a flight attendant. It's just like, you're just moved right away. Yes, uh, it's very compelling. It's it's strange now. I'm at an age where like, she's like, yeah, basically my wife's age. Like you could have just been like, <laughs> she's a little. She's not that much older than me, but you, instead you threw your wife. So. Well, my wife's four years older than I am. So. Oh right, yeah. Yeah, um, and then the character is two years older than my wife is. So it, it is. Su- yeah. There it is suck? a bigger difference. Don't it suck when you see people old in movies and you always saw them as old and then they say their age, and it's really close to yours now, and you're like. Are we past our prime? Oh yeah, you are for sure. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, she's forty-four. I thought she was fifty. And then he's fifty-six, which is interesting. So he's actually quite a bit older than her, Robert Forster, who's so amazing. Who's just such a. That's the other thing. The characters in this are great in a way I don't see in the other movies. Like the characters have like psychology. With Robert Forster, his face—you just know he's been lied to so much. He right. Just doesn't trust people. And it's just all written, kind of like Tom Lee Jones in No Country. His whole character is written on his face. It's, it's similar. It, yeah. It's it's similar. To, sorry to interrupt. It's similar um, themes, obviously. But the, I love the scene towards the end. We'll jump around a little bit because I took a bunch of notes that because I was like, oh, man, this is great. And that's great. But I love speaking of him being older and just done and whatever. The whole thing of I love that he takes all the teeth out of what the fuck was that? All right, my mic. Just, I'm good. I, Jesus, I got fucking Cosmo Kramer, <laughs> same coat. Um, so he takes all the teeth out of Odell. Odell is supposed to be this like badass guy, and he shoots Chris Tucker, who obviously would be Kevin Hart if they made it now. Yeah, and yeah. He's, he's this guy. He's supposed to be this badass guy, and all these things. And in the end, he's like, "Anything you want to say to me before we go in there?" And Robert Forster is just completely unfazed of course he knows that they're all in there he's completely right. lying to odell and he's just not nervous completely unfazed doesn't give a shit and part of that is because he's been through it a million times he's right. had way tougher people right. he just goes to his house he's like you got a lot of balls coming here he's like i don't give a fuck about you well that's what's interesting when you look at the maturity of jackie brown compared to pulp fiction and pulp fiction and red River dogs the characters are all actually cool they're actually cool right like cool characters and jackie brown you're actually seeing pathetic people, which is, of course, what I love the most because I can relate because I'm pathetic. But I truly think everyone, you know, if you know anyone, we're all pathetic. You finally so said something that you're not going to get any arguments. But. <laughs> but it's true. That's to me, life is like if you p- throw away all the bullshit, we're all pathetic. And Jackie Brown, no one's fucking cool. See, in Pulp Fiction, Samuel Jackson is the epitome of cool. And then in Jackie Brown, you so you see him trying to be cool and failing. You see him trying to impress people of how cool he is and like putting on a pose and then Jackie Brown has her gun to his fucking nuts. You know what right. I mean? Like it's like you see you see the patheticness of all the characters and the fucking the, Samuel Jackson is hilarious in that movie. Like the way he's trying to impress De Niro the whole time is just like he's really just really because he knows De Niro's hard and he just really wants De Niro to think of him as like a fucking the badass man you know yeah and and de niro was above him at one point but yeah. he went off to jail so he's still trying to impress him the de niro character is amazing i i know i love amazing. the little the little detail of 
the day of the robbery, De Niro has his hair done. Like he's an old school professional. It's yeah. the only time you see him with his hair slicked back. He's yeah. got a fine tooth comb, and he's like, "Okay, we're going to we're going to rob. I'm gonna put on my best shirt, and <laughs> and you comb your hair because I'm a fucking professional." He's a professional. He has that. I think he's a man. If people think he's not good in this. So, I feel like he told me someone said that. Was that on the car? No, someone that? was just saying that De Niro hasn't been good since uh, Casino. And I was like, no, Jackie Brown came after and he's fucking amazing in Jackie Brown. He's amazing. It's a it's a great like kind of comedic performance. He's like, has that day's His lines are hilarious. When he fucks Bridget Fonda, he's just like, that hit the spot. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And she's so hot, by the way. He's so hot. But once again, they're all past her prime. She's past her prime and trying to live this young kind of surfer girl life. And the way she's fucking trying to get De Niro to like think of Samuel Jackson, the jackass, so she could con him is so funny to me. Um, and I, I, I feel like I relate most to the De Niro character because he's still good. He's trying his best. And he, you know, Od Odell Beckham, whatever the fuck his name is at the end, Odell Roby at the end, he's like, you used to be beautiful, but he's like, he made like a, the mistake he made feels like I can relate to it. He's like, I saw that guy. I kind of thought it was weird, but I didn't know what to do. I, I, I don't know. It's like, it's actually quite yeah. relatable in a way. Well, but his other mistake was murdering someone. In but parking lot. I actually relate to that scene too. <laughs> I actually get satisfaction from that murder where it she's just because it feels like she's basically a bully in that scene oh yeah like, i've been in that feeling where i fucked up i'm mad at myself and somebody is just needling you and needling you and it's i actually find it i know it sounds psychotic but i actually find it satisfying when he pulls up the gun and fucking shoots her and he's like see i, I feel that way <laughs> all the time not in a relationship but with with fucking social media and and, and club managers and all that stuff of like how do you like that Right. I mean, it is this psychotic thing where he, to win an argument, he killed someone and then he's still arguing with her. He's like, car's right here. Like, like what's more relatable than that? <laughs> I mean, that's like uh, the, the, the equivalent is like blocking someone on social media and then walking around being like, yeah, because he fucking won <laughs> because the electoral college, you fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's like killing someone does not. You're still angry afterwards. That's like right. you're still like a little pissed off. No, it's great. And it's also a kind of a, sh a very shocking moment where this kind of you see how violent this buffoon is, which is always a shocking moment. It's, you know, Fargo does that really well when you're watching buffoons and then they're like legitimately violent. It's really right. scary, which is true. Like, like the Capitol, it's like someone can be an idiot and still be really dangerous and violent, you know? Of course. It's kind I mean, of like, a, could, mostly, yeah. You could argue, yeah, that's the most violent people. But you can kind of laugh at their buffoonery and then you get shocked. You're like, look at those idiots and then they're stomping a police officer to death. So yeah, no, that part's great. I mean, everything, the conversation between uh, her, I relate the most to Robert Forster because there's so many beautiful black women I want to have sex with, but I'm ultimately afraid of them uh, <laughs> and can't commit at the end. But like, uh, which is also such a, in terms of like seeing characters make a choice, like the ending is incredible. Like him, I mean, what do you think about that ending? To me, it's kind of like, he is in love with her, but he's just a little too scared of her at the end. Yeah, of course. I mean, and, and that's like so fucking relatable that he's intimidated by her and he's intimidated to leave his job. I mean, like he wants to retire and he just literally made a fifty thousand dollar payday. So yeah. he was obviously it feels like he was set up to retire. And the fact that he's like, I just decided I'm going to retire. He gets 50 grand and now has this opportunity. And you could tell he's still not going to he's going to keep working. He can't go for the goal like she can. And in a way, we are him. We are. She is like the the character in the movie who does survive, you know, who does like get, get, get what she wants. And we're, we're all stuck with him, just like afraid to lo lose everything, but still just like reminiscing about what we could have had, you know, that Which, shot of him smiling at the end with her lips still on his lips. It's just like such a beautiful, real uh, moment, you know? And in contrast, by the way, racially, the black woman gets, so is the one that gets, that wins. She's the winner and everyone else is the loser. Yeah. I mean, it's, so yeah, there you no. go. <laughs> well, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying, uh, I mean, she's still very much a criminal, but anyway, but, no, I'm joking. Like, and also she wasn't black in the book. He actually made her black. Right. Yes. Uh, um, no, I think, I, I, um, I think, yeah, I'm glad you agree with me because as I'm saying this, like, I'm like, it, it's insane if you like, so this is what I'm saying. It's insane to me if you like Pulp Fiction more than Jackie Brown, just because for me, it's like, there's so much emotion in real life in Jackie Brown. And right. I will say most people like Pulp Fiction more. 
And that's but, where maybe well, my resentment comes from. Pulp Fiction is more fun. I mean, it's just more yeah. fun. There's no question about it. I mean, there's more death. There's more jokes. There's more violence. I couldn't even the, get the music's through Jackie better. Brown. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm kidding. So but, uh, it's 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 funner. I mean, it's it's like say it's like someone that likes fucking, uh, you know, I can't think of two bands without fucking starting a, a debate. But, you know, Nickelback or whatever. Or, or, <laughs> um, are we looking for? Well, I don't want to compare. That's, that's where I'm having a hard time. because I don't want to say fucking stained and then compare, yeah. you know, a shit band to to whatever um, Pulp Fiction. But Pulp Fiction is more fun. For sure. Yes. Yes, 100%. But for me, art is more than just fun. For me, art is more than just fun. For me, movies are more than just fun. There's something where I think about my own life and I connect to and I, and I relate to characters and learn about characters. I understand so, that. I'm just saying you're not an idiot if you like this movie because even you agree that this one's more fun. So people, people, a lot of people like funner movies more than unfun movies. Most people like fucking Dumb and Dumber more than they like Citizen Kane. Right. Well, I actually do think it's a better movie, but like, uh, it's, it's, um, I think Dumb and Dumber is better than Citizen Kane. No, I, I agree. I'm saying Dumb and Dumber. Oh, okay. Better, I see. You know, it, yeah. Um, but, uh, they both have, um, but I will say, um, uh, it's kind of funny because they both have, uh, you know, it's the connection between them. Uh, let me see. Sleds, Aspen, they, Snow. They're, they're both based on a confusion about a, a company name, thinking it's something else because Rosebud is like oh, a right. company name. Right. I think it's a girl, and then they're probably like Samsonite is, uh, <laughs> you know, the briefcase company. Yeah, I mean that's one joke in the movie. It's not the <laughs> well, plot I just of the movie. Say, that's a connection, you know. Um, oh, I see. <laughs> but uh, um, so yeah, uh, yes, you can like. Obviously, people like Paul Fiction more, but I and to, the, to to which I say, I think I, I want more out of movies than those people. Right. So for the people who go, don't you want to have, you know, how could you like Paul? Because people wouldn't, if I said I like Jackie Brown more than Paul Fiction, a lot of people would be like, you're a fucking idiot. You know what I mean? But I also, again, it's not just fun. It's not like uh, Passenger 57. No, you know right, what I mean? Right. I mean, there is style. There's an yes, incredibly yes, unique it's style. style. It's incredibly yeah. unique. It stands out. There's great humor. There's great compelling characters and it's, scenes. It's and what rape. we call it. It's uh, asceticism. It's like the... Um, the value of it is not in what it's about. The value of it is, is how it tells the story, how it executes. Right. It's in, the movie is all in its execution. Right. But for me, I guess I need a movie to be more than just, at the end of the day, for comparing them, I need a movie to be more than just execution. I need it to have something I can connect to emotionally. And like for Jackie Brown, there's just so much. I mean, the scene between her and him when they're, together like talking about getting older is just such a beautiful fucking scene all their it's conversations like, are great they keep having these great conversations over and over again um, kind of, but, but the part where he's like you, you feel uh, about getting old and she's like my ass is bigger he's like nothing wrong with that i mean it's to me it's one of the best like older person even though it's like our age some of them older person romantic development in a movie um i took some fun little notes that i thought were interesting yeah uh one that I wasn't, that I never noticed before, maybe I should have, is when he's first sitting at, oh, the second time Odell's visiting uh, Max Cherry and he asks her her name and she, he says, Brown, Jackie Brown, which he <laughs> says it like Bond, James Bond, and he's a bail oh, yeah. bondsman. So that's fun. Oh, fuck. Is that, that you or is that the movie? Who, who's pointing that out? I mean, do you think- I'm pointing that out. Movie? I watched it last night and thought of that. I was like, oh, that's like a James Bond. And I but thought, do you think Bond. Tarantino's trying to do that or is that just you making those connections? What do you think? Oh, I, I mean, certainly if you say Brown, Jackie Brown, same initials also. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, it feels like you can't not know that you're doing you're Bond, at. James Bond, Brown, Jackie Brown. I don't know that he purposely was like, and it's a bail bondsman, James Bond. That might have just been. Yeah. But you're going to find the Tarantino little, uh, what do they call them? Um, Easter eggs. Easter eggs. You got the orange balloon. And well, that, it's pretty good. And how about this we one? Watch I thought them was all a hundred times, but you know. Yeah. Well, this one I thought was interesting too. Last night that I noticed is he says at the beginning, the first time he visits Max, he says, "Where can I put my ash?" And he said, "You can use that cup." And he does a mug in the cup. And then when Jackie Brown is sitting at his desk later in the movie, there's an ashtray sitting there. So at some point oh, he went he out got and got an ashtray. An ashtray. <laughs> and there's a second thing like that. He comes out of the bathroom. Max, <laughs> Max comes out of the bathroom and Odell says, you didn't, I didn't hear you. He's, oh, he says, uh, 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 which is from Jurassic Park, which he's in that scene with Newman. 
Uh, uh, uh. I was thinking about that. I was because when he goes ah uh, ah uh, ah, uh, I'm like, that sounds so familiar. Yeah, but, and it's uh, from the scene that he's in in Jurassic Park, and he says Newman's uh, doing it. Yes, but, but Samuel Jackson's like, God damn it, you fat bastard. Yeah, that's yeah, funny. exactly. Yeah. So now it's his turn. But also he says, ah uh, ah uh, ah, uh, I didn't hear you wash your hands. And later in the movie, Jackie's waiting. At the end of the movie, Jackie's there, and he comes out, and he's just washed his hands. He's like wringing his hands. So Odell is having quite an effect on it. <laughs> He went out and bought an ashtray and he started washing his hands. So Odell has, but it's interesting because he's having a little effect on him and that he's going to wash his hands and buys an ashtray. But when he's like, are you sure you don't want to tell me what's happening there? He's not affected by that. Like the death stuff he's not affected by, but the little things. And Odell is a cool black guy and he's trying to get Jackie Brown. So maybe he's subtly taking in this advice from the cool black guy. Yeah, because sometimes black people are like, we'll we'll, uh, attack white guys for having bad hygiene. He's trying to like up his hygiene kind of thing. Yeah, I, I, he's trying to impress Jackie, so he's like, "This is this could be so a way." So he washes his hands after the bathroom. Right. <laughs> hey, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I washed my hands after I took a piss. Isn't that hot? <laughs> well, it's kind of funny. I guess Robert Forster's that character is very uh, um, it, uh, easily influenced because then he, he goes gets into phonics at the store at the uh, old uh, out, uh, record store. It's very nostalgic that scene when he's in. Uh, right. Where, wherever he's in or whatever. Yeah, it's like Sam Goody out. or something. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he's very easily influenced. That's a great point. Um, yeah, those are just some little nuggety and things. And there's a scene at the end where he has a ponytail and a uh, <laughs> ammo hat. Do you remember that and part? A, <laughs> a green shirt. But also, Michael J. Fox is amazing in that. Michael J. Fox is amazing in that movie. My one complaint is about his like crackhead girl. Um, she's a little much in the scene where she's like yeah. doing like wacky shit she's like oh oh, okay like it's a little like all right all right (laughs) right right no for sure yeah she's a little over the top but for the most part it 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 does feel doesn't it all just kind of feel real to me i guess maybe i don't know it just feels like a real i don't know just like a real characters and like uh i don't know i i I find the whole thing very powerful i I guess i guess you know you're rooting for her but you know she's been through so much shit michael keaton's also a little like not, I, I feel like you wouldn't think twice about that character, but because they have Michael Keaton in him, you're like, there's not much to that character. But if they just oh. didn't have Michael Keaton in it, you wouldn't think about it, you know? I, I, I don't know. I love the character. I love when they're out to eat. I just, I, I love all those really? details. Yeah, yeah. I love the sunglasses and the way he finds the cocaine is great. And he's like, what's this? I, I think the whole thing is executed so well. I think he's so good. I guess I felt like there was... You know, it seemed like they didn't know. It felt like there's more to that character that got cut out or something. I, I feel like he's a biker or something, and that's like his character. I guess I didn't fully. I guess I when you see Michael Keaton, you want a little more from him. You know? Well, to me, that's interesting. He's just classic cop. He's got the sunglasses, the leather leather coat, and um, mm-hmm. you know, he's talking like this. He's chewing the gum. He's like, I don't know. I think he's just he's he's cop. That's his thing. I don't know, but I feel like when you get Michael Keaton, you you want more than just cop. I guess I would want Batman. <laughs> yeah, want Batman. Well, it's just like in every other movie, he's like fucking Batman or Beetlejuice, and now he's just like a cop. I guess he's <laughs> an F- <laughs> FT, uh, ATL. I mean, now this is now you're doing the thing that you do to the movie that you love. What do you mean? You're like nitpicking this movie hey, that you're like it's a I masterpiece. Can nitpick and love. I you can love and nitpick at the same time. I mean, I I do do that, but I'm just like. I don't know. Let's I just don't, leave it at it's great. This is when you haven't pissed anyone off on this one. I don't. Well, that's just the way I see things. I don't think anything. I mean, there are some things that maybe feel perfect, but I don't think anything is perfection. Is not a real thing. Like it's like I think you can find flaws in anything, but I don't think that it, just because you find flaws in something doesn't mean you hate the movie. I think a lot of people confuse those two. No, you know of course. I mean? like, no, I've I've had this a million times where like I again like I argue. Goodfellas and Casino. I hate when people say Casino's better because it's stupid to say that. But then I have to argue, right. and it makes me seem like I don't love Casino. And I, I have the feeling I'm that, like you, I'm like I like Casino more than you like Casino. It's just not yeah. better than Goodfellas. Well, who said that? That has to be like a lot of people. I don't, know, don't get me started. People got to write it in the comments. It, it's crazy. There's like a contingency really? of people. It's fucking banana. It's like the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. That's insane. Yeah, that's just like insanity but like uh <laughs> yeah I mean, well same thing with pulp fiction i mean there's so much stuff i love about pulp fiction but it just you know there's and there's a lot of stuff i have issues with but that doesn't mean i don't love the stuff i love it's just like you know you can have 
for me, movies are like people. You have complicated relationships with them, you know? Yes, um, I, I feel that way about you. I mean, I, I can't stand you, but I, I love you, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Jackie, I mean, it, it is true. Like, Jackie Brown is slow at times. You know what I mean? In a way, Pulp Fiction isn't. Yes. You know? um, but it's just like, to me, that's the kind of thing I like. I like, uh, I like his, uh, I like that. I like connecting to those characters. And I, I, I like characters being pathetic. And I like characters getting older. I always connect to that. Right. Um, I feel like a failure. Um, I'm sorry you feel that way. You're not a failure. Yeah. You're doing great, and uh, well, we gotta yeah. we gotta wrap this thing up here. But I was trying to joke about me feeling like a failure, but I feel like the wall behind me is so sad, and we made it <laughs> too sad to be funny. Like I was like, I was just trying to joke about it, but you have this like I'm in the corner of a crack den kind of situation here. Right. Kind of, <laughs> kind I of did a I lot. shot a sketch a long time ago. It wasn't executed the way I wanted it to. It's not as good as I wanted it to be, but it was about a person that is suicidal. And he's making a better case than all his friends are <laughs> for him to not kill himself. Like everything they say, he had counters and they're like, ah, oh, shit. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. You got a good point. Yeah. And then the, yeah. one of the big jokes was like, um, you have a great car. And then someone's like, your car is getting towed. And he's like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> and it was, it was Did pretty kill funny. At the end? Did he kill himself at the I end? I can't even remember. I think it might be on YouTube. I, I can't remember if he did or not. I'm I think he did. It and I, I'll watch it. I'll do whatever he does at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a little Russian stuff. roulette. Yeah, I'll, I'll do either one. Um, so I, I guess we can't really rank. We usually rank, but like we, this whole episode is ranking. Yeah, I guess so. Well, I'm still torn on Pulp Fiction, Jackie Brown. I mean, like, again, it, it, it's very difficult. Ultimately, because here's how I look at it. Like, if I could only watch one of these movies again in my life, it would be Pulp Fiction. Well, that's what, okay. So th let's, let's maybe wrap it up on this little discussion because you said this to me in text the other day and I found it interesting because we have a different value of what our favorite movies is because I remember well I told you to watch Nashville my favorite movie and you're like this movie how can you think this movie is more watchable than Goodfellas or something you text me something like that yeah I don't think it's more watchable but for me like a great movie isn't only um valued by the fact that you can watch it over again like I, I mean maybe that sounds silly but for me a great movie is how it affects me afterwards and what sticks with me. What well, resonates. But I agree. But that's why I think there's like, I, and I've had this discussion a lot of places and a lot of times, like there's, there's a discussion of great movies and favorite movies. Like again, like right. Field of Dreams and Back to the Future and Ferris Bueller are in my favorite movies, but I don't think they're great. I don't think they're better than fucking, uh, you know, right. the Sting. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, if you actually listen to us, we're not actually arguing that much. We actually have some of the same opinions, we just have different emotional reactions to the things in the movies. We probably agree about Field of Dreams on some level, but I'm just angrier about the stuff in the movie than you. You know what I mean? Or I'm not, or maybe we- Well, I think- That's a great Field of Dreams. That's no, a bad example. But, but we touched on that with Field of Dreams. Like to me, I like, Field of Dreams is in my top 10 favorite movies, but I take more issue with people I have more issue with someone that says they think Bull Durham stinks than I do with someone that says they think Field of Dreams stinks. Which shows that we are in agreement. Bull, yeah. Bull Durham is, is a better film, but I just like yeah. Field of Dreams more because I have a fucking dad that doesn't hug me. Right, right. And my dad hugged me, so I'm like, it's clearly a piece of shit movie. Like, it's just, I, I'm more objective because I was loved. <laughs> and you don't I, know baseball. You're, you're barely American. <laughs> It's like, I don't even yeah. know if you qualify as an American. Well, what do we, I have, it's been hard for me to get back in the country a couple of times. What are we, uh, what's my name? What are we, uh, are we talking about favorite movies or best movies here? What, what, what's the? Well, I guess we could do both. I mean, but this one is one, I'm just like unraveling at the end of this. This one is one <laughs> that I have, I see Pulp Fiction and Jackie Brown similarly in both categories, I guess is the point. That's what's confusing here is better movie and movie I like more. They're both very similar. They're both neck and neck on both categories for me. But the choice ultimately is between something more entertaining, but that's ultimately about style and something that's, I mean, still entertaining, but ultimately more about having an emotional connection to the characters or being connecting more to the content, right? Which one do you value more ultimately? Isn't that the question? I guess so. It's tricky. I guess for this, to, we got to wrap up here. So I'm going to say yeah. this is a tie. My favorite and best is I'm tied. 
Jackie Brown and Pulp Fiction, and Reservoir Dogs is number three. I don't really like how you do the tie. I didn't know the tie was allowed. Because <laughs> um, now am I allowed to do the tie? Or, uh, no. so <laughs> I don't know about the reading. Some... We didn't discuss the reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's like my friend once said. He said, you know what? He said, you know what the favorite, my, the best movie the last 10 years was? The Wire. And I got so angry at him because I'm like, you're not allowed to do, you can't just say a TV show and act like that's like a movie to make well, a point. I talked about this on Tuesdays with <laughs> Stories where I got almost in a fist fight with a friend of mine because he was saying his favorite comedian is Mark Twain. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I mean, yeah. like, I mean, and like Mark was just sitting there just like, this is like years ago. And like, I was pretty friendly with Mark. He had never met this other guy. And Mark just sat there like staring. And we were like a manager and an umpire. I mean, like screaming at each other. Cause he's like, Mark Some Twain. People... <laughs> Some people think if they just don't answer the question the way it's asked, somehow it's profound. If you just say something that's not true, somehow it's more profound. Like you're thinking outside the box, you know? Right. Um, but it's very obnoxious because Mark Twain is clearly not a comedian. And right. <laughs> even if he said funny shit, you were not around. I mean, I, I, I do know he was poor, but either way, you were not a, around to see him. Right. And there's no video of it. But anyway. So yeah, for me, Pulp, uh, yeah, obviously Jackie Brown, then Pulp Fiction, then Reservoir Dogs. But, uh, but probably I laughed the most at Reservoir Dogs, honestly. Um, yes, Reservoir Dogs. This is a good is... episode, we did, yeah. No, this is great, I loved it. This is good, right? Yeah, yeah. it was really fun. And I, I'm surprised, I, I didn't know you, Jackie Brown at the end. I didn't know you were, I'm, I'm glad I loved to know it. you were as torn. Yeah. Jackie Brown, I love, I remember it came out Christmas Day, 97, and I remember it leading up to it, because that was the first one, at that point, I had been obsessed with Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs, so that was the first one that was an event, and it said, like, this Christmas, Santa's got a brand new bag, and it had the little bag of cat. I remember the trailer, where she says, like, yeah, yeah. and and then Bridget the Fonda's trailer, like, why don't we just take it? Yeah, I remember the trailer, too, because in the the, the, the AK-47 line, one of the, one of his lines when he's watching the movies in the trailer, I can't remember what, but yeah. And I think some people thought it as a drop off from Pulp Fiction, but to me, it's clearly an emotional maturity and a progression. Yeah, three greats. Um, and yeah, we're, we're back next week. Uh, we're gonna do, uh, oh, we'll talk about it later, but we're gonna do Fincher, right? Oh, sure, yeah, let's do Fincher, that'll be fun. Let's do Fincher next week, yeah. I think we feel now, ex exactly the same on Fincher, by the way. Yeah, I think we do too. But that would be fun just to make fun of some of those movies and uh, love one of them a lot. A little overstylized. Um, um, but we'll get into it. Sure. Um, all right, so go follow us. Check out Ronan's uh, albums. Are you performing your show? Oh, yeah, I'm doing it this Sunday. This Sunday at 7 p.m. Uh, on Zoom. Just go to my Instagram, the link to my solo show. It's getting good. It's my fourth performance. It's very funny. It's sad. Um, and uh, I don't know, sad's probably not a selling point. It's just funny. <laughs> it's really depressing. You're going to hate yourself. But you can do it at my Instagram, the link in my bio. My Instagram is at Ron on comedy, R A A N A N comedy. Yes. And uh, yes, yeah, subscribe and check out. I did a little short film sketch thing called Trim with Greg Stone. And uh, oh, yeah, it was great. It's hilarious. So funny. Oh, thanks. Yeah. He's so funny. So yeah, do those things. And uh, yes, thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you. Oh, wait. Wrong button.